disorders, and this is labeled trauma disorders and not PTSD, because we're going to talk about the spectrum of disorders that can result from trauma, PTSD being one of them, but actually not the most common. And since the, a, a large percentage of the patients that we work with that have substance use issues also have a trauma history, um, hopefully this will be some helpful information, um, both for assessment, but also for conceptualization. And then uh, I'm just gonna very, very briefly in introduce uh, trauma-informed care and some of the main components that go into that. Um, so uh, I've already covered my objectives, what we're gonna talk about. So let's start the conversation by talking about a difference between stress and trauma. Um, these things often get um, uh, labeled as the same. And, and as clinicians, uh, if, if we're not, um, uh, I, I guess, given clarity on how to actually diagnose uh, what trauma is, sometimes we can confuse it with what would be considered um, stress. Uh, so it's important to be able to differentiate the two. So this is a stress curve, and I always like to show this because oftentimes we don't think about um, uh, stress quite in this way. Um, and Rana, will you let me know if any questions pop up for me um, while we're doing this? Sure, I will uh, let you know. Perfect. Okay. Um, so, so you can see that this is uh, uh, the level of stress uh, across performance. And so, when when people talk about wanting to have as little stress as possible, you can tell that that that's that's not ideal. That actually there is an optimal level of stress, which is in this yellow zone. Um, because if we have too little stress in our life, we're considered underloaded. We don't have enough motivation. Um, to, to get out of bed in the morning, to do some of the things that are actually important to help us uh, maintain a healthy performance. So we need a little bit of stress in life actually to, to push us to perform at optimal levels. However, it does hit a tipping point. And so that's where you start to see fatigue and exhaustion occur where there's either too much stress for too long, the intensity of the stressor is more than the individual can handle, or there aren't enough supports to accommodate for either of those things, in which case the system starts to overload and go into the, the red zone, which is where burnout and breakdown occur. And we know that one of the number one reasons why people will relapse, even after sustained recovery, is because of interpersonal stressors. So this is an important thing to understand and educate patients on is, is the role that, that you don't want to have too little, but you definitely don't want to have too much. That plays both into um, our recovery picture, and it also um, uh, gives us some information about how vulnerable people are, either because of trauma or um, if trauma exposure occurs. Oops. Okay. Um, so thinking about stress as something that occurs throughout the lifespan as something that's actually necessary to help us develop resiliency. Resiliency is a, is a, a conceptual um, a model that is sort of like when we have really strong muscles that allow us to, to lift heavy weights. So psychologically, if we've had enough stress in our life, we've developed a series of uh, coping skills or, or psychological uh, 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 coping factors that will allow us to handle future stress because stress never really goes away. So it's, it's important to, to work with patients to help them understand how they can move toward building resiliency because it's not about having no stress. Um, and, and we know that patients will have different responses to stressors depending on things like the intensity of the stressor, their individual history, um, their prior experiences with stress, and this is bi-directional. So like I said, if they've had too little, they may not have developed that resiliency. If they've had way too much, they've been operating in that red zone for far too long, then they're, uh, they're, beyond, they're working beyond their capacity. Um, what type of coping style they have, and then what type of supports there are, both internal and external. But in general, as human beings, we have an innate ability to adapt to cope um, to adapt to stress and cope with life fairly effectively with no intervention necessary. That's typically. This is called the adaptation model, um, and this explains uh, how people function short-term and long-term in, in regards to stress or trauma, which we're going to talk about here in a minute. Um, so the blue line is our homeostatic baseline. So that's how we as human beings are functioning um, on any given day, both our, our body and our psychology. That's sort of where we are, where we are. 
When a stressor occurs, and it doesn't always have to be something threatening or difficult, it can be something exhilarating like the birth of a child or a wedding or a new job. Um, it's still a stressor. We have an initial dip, and that initial dip could be um, the first couple of hours or it could be the first couple of days, sort of depending on the type of resiliency that we have. We have initial dip, and that's where we're not functioning so well, or maybe we seem out of sorts, or maybe our concentration is a little bit effective, uh, affected. Sorry. And then we have what's called an alarm response. And that alarm response is, is a psychological um, process that triggers neurochemical process. And that's where all the cortisol and adrenaline, all that stuff comes on, online to help us function actually more effectively than we were before. So that's where that resistance is building. So we're, we're actually able to go without sleep or we're able to kind of um, continue to function at very high levels without additional supports. That's that alarm response kicking us into overdrive to get us through the stressor um, in the short term. The problem is we will crash. So we will go into an exhaustion if we don't, if the stressor doesn't go away, or if we don't have enough uh, internal or external resources to support pulling us back to our baseline. So after a stressor, we need to have some of those supports come into place to pull us back to our homeostatic baseline. And if not, then we end up in what's called a chronic stress state, which will lead to psychological and physiological um, disorder. So this is what's happening over the lifespan that's building resiliency, is that, that ability to return to baseline is, is increasing our coping, increasing those muscles so that we can handle future stressors. For our patients that have experienced chronic stress, probably from the time of birth, um, depending on their family system, um, they're, they're not necessarily, they're building resiliency, so that's why we want to capitalize on strengths, but they're not necessarily always able to return to baseline effectively. So what's happening over time is they're sinking further and further and developing more of these psychological and physiological illnesses that we associate with chronic stress. Um, so typically when it's an acute stressor, we don't need to do much. There really isn't any inter intervention needed. That's different than chronic stress. Chronic stress is going to activate that alarm system over and over and over. And like I said, over time, really wear down the individual so that they end up experiencing uh, some form of either psychological or physiological disorder. And that's when intervention is needed and, and where we're, we're sort of treating the, the symptoms that, that, that pop up. So um, uh, that's why it's important to always be thinking about what is the level of chronic stress that my patient has experienced over the course of their lifetime, and how can I keep that on the table when conceptualizing all of the, the uh, diag diagnoses that I'm looking at to treat, because um, it probably in, in some shape or form could be connected to that. Now that's different than trauma. So trauma falls into the definition of actual or threatened death, serious injury, or sexual violation resulting from one of the following scenarios. So that could be either directly experiencing the event, so that's like a sexual or physical assault or car accident, could be witnessing the traumatic event, so that's similar to being in a domestic violence situation where maybe they're not the one being abused, but they're witnessing the abuse, um, learning of the crime, uh, or violent death of a close family member with vivid details. So this is a relatively unusual, but it does happen. So this would be um, an example of like a mother actually getting uh, her hands on the crime scene report of a child's uh, violent car accident. So it has to be the death of a close relative that they get vivid details of. They essentially recreate the trauma in their mind as if they witnessed it. So it sort of creates the uh, second bullet point. And then lastly, experiencing repeated or extreme exposure to aversive details. So this is where we're looking at detectives, military personnel, um, people that are in sort of the aftermath um, or somehow associated with having to view uh, uh, details of traumatic events uh, uh, repeatedly. They, they're at risk for that level of trauma exposure. So if it's not that, it doesn't count as a trauma. Anything that doesn't fall into those categories falls into the stress category. Um, and why that's important is, is to sort of think about traumatic events are stressful events, but stressful events are not traumatic events necessarily. And, and we wanna be able to differentiate that because we know that innately human beings have the ability to deal with stress. 
And usually what we're needing to do is help in booster supports, or we're looking at a chronic stress profile, which is gonna look very similar to what trauma does, right? So, so whether it's chronic stress or whether it's traumatic exposure, they could have very similar looking disorders. Um, there are different types of trauma, and we can label that as strain versus shock is the first level of category. A shock trauma, like an acute stressor, is a single event, short in duration, and high in intensity. So that's where we think about like a stranger assault or a mugging or a car accident. It's a single event that has limited time versus a strain trauma, which is multiple events that are long in duration and, and tend to be less in intensity. Not because the trauma itself is less intense, but it's because they've begun to predict it and habituate to it. So that's like domestic violence, childhood abuse, those types of things. The very first time they experienced it, it would have been high in intensity. But the 27th time they experienced it, the intensity would have dropped because they would have habituated to it. Now, strain events can be labeled in two different categories. One is chronic, which is just multiple events over a long period of time, and complex, which is specific to multiple events in childhood caused at the hands of a caretaker. So a complex trauma only applies if it was a childhood type of abuse or trauma at the hands of the person responsible for taking care of them. And the reason why it's important to know these different uh, labels is because they tend to have different outcomes. They tend to have different prognoses associated with them. We know that childhood traumas are much harder to, uh, to adjust to and move into that, back to that homeostatic place than adult events. So um, of course that's gonna vary, vary by individual, but typically adult events seem to be less detrimental on an individual than uh, chronic events. We know that chronic stress and chronic trauma are much more associated with negative health outcomes. And childhood events, particularly ongoing, particularly complex trauma are some of the worst. They have the worst outcomes and they tend to be the most long lasting in terms of their impact. And that's because they affect how the brain develops. Um, and one of the, the studies that showed this was the ACE study. Um, and that was a, a longitudinal study which looked at large, large uh, data sets uh, to see what are the, the uh, impacts of adverse childhood experiences and uh, complex trauma, all different types of childhood trauma um, and, and profound poverty, neglect, those were all things that were, that were captured. What they showed is a very predictable outcome that when those experiences happen, particularly chronically in childhood, um, then it disrupts how the brain is developing. And those types of children, they, they tend to look almost like they have ADHD, like they're in that fight or flight state chronically and then that of course is going to disrupt how they develop socially emotionally cognitively which then makes them vulnerable to a whole host of uh, risky behaviors um, substance abuse very much associated with that which then leads to later disease disability social problems involvement in the criminal justice system and of course we know the outcome of that is early death we also know that all of those stressors on the, on the system are going to trigger epi epigenetic mechanisms. So that's gonna place them at much more vulnerability to things like schizophrenia or other diseases that are associated with stress or with um, uh, trauma exposure. And we also know that there is a um, intergenerational transmission component. So when communities are, uh, are, are experiencing profound poverty or community violence or things that are happening um, in entire communities, mass incarceration that will affect entire communities or, or um, substance abuse will affect entire communities. Then we know that this happens generation after generation, um, uh, thus decreasing the lifespan of that entire population. Um, so, so this is a really problematic thing and we know it affects a lot of the communities that we work with here in New Mexico. So that's why I think the majority of the folks that we're working with probably at some point in their life have had trauma exposure, which could m be linked to their substance use um, uh, disorder um, and could even be uh, kind, of, kind of hand in hand because once they develop those high risk behaviors, now they're even more vulnerable to additional tra uh, traumatization so, or later victimization. Um, so, uh, one thing to, to, to talk about is, of course, we're talking in big numbers in general, 
but individuals will have varied responses to trauma. A lot of it depends on the type of the trauma, like we talked about, adult versus childhood, um, interpersonal versus disaster. We know that interpersonal traumas are much harder to accommodate than like a natural disaster or a car accident. Um, proximity to the event, so if it happened to them versus if they were uh, a witness to it. If they've had previous traumas, again, this is bi-directional, kind of like with stressors, they, they could have had a trauma, accommodated it well, and developed some really good resilience uh, to manage a future trauma that would occur. But when we're dealing with folks that have had, you know, five, six, 15 traumas, then it's depleted their reservoir. Then they're, they no longer have the resources to manage. Um, and, and then we, we see them uh, experiencing psychological disease. Um, state. The relationship to the abuser, if they're known versus unknown. So we know it has a worse outcome if it's a known abuser. Um, and that's why some of those complex traumas uh, that occur in childhood by a parent or caregiver are some of the worst ones that uh, uh, have long-term psychological impacts. Um, the individual's coping skills and or vulnerability. The response of the support system makes a big difference. And I think this is why we also see poor outcomes in communities that have been affected um, by, by trauma and violence and substance abuse is because the support system itself is unhealthy and is unable to respond in a, in a supportive, um, protective, healthy way. So when the individual experiences the trauma, they either A, don't feel like they can tell anybody, um, or B, if they do tell people, they're met with, well, it was your fault, why did you do that? Um, and, and a lot of dismissive sort of invalidating things that, that, that end up resulting in poor outcomes. Um, and then we know the, the level of stress at the time of the trauma is very problematic. So another reason why it's important to differentiate between stress and trauma is um, for individuals that are experiencing homelessness, um, chronic issues with, with lack of resources, there's, there's a um, just ongoing stress and has been there for a long time, then they get assaulted or then they end up in a domestic uh, relationship that turns violent um, or you know, any number of things that could have, they get into a bad car accident, it tips the scale. It pushes them further than they would have been if they hadn't had all that stress on board. Um, which is why it's so important that we're always working with uh, peer support, case management, all of those, you know, CCSS, to be able to provide some of that resource management to decrease the level of stress, um, which will help in treating the trauma overall. And then the perception of the event. So we know that this is where a lot of therapeutic intervention can be extremely helpful because if somebody uh, perceives the event, um, blames themselves, feels ashamed, feels like um, there was something they could have or should have done differently to prevent the trauma. Um, and this is particularly true with childhood trauma. Um, they've developed a cognitive structure that's gonna keep them stuck, that is not gonna help them with their recovery. Um, and that could be true with stress or trauma. We also know that um, just in general, um, our numbers in New Mexico are, are actually higher. They're in the 80s. But um, in general, about 77% of all adults will experience at least one trauma. But of those people, 70% will recover without anything. Um, they just need time and social support. So that's really positive because we just talked about all the negative outcomes that could happen. But just like with how we accommodate stress, trauma is a type of extreme stress. We can also accommodate for traumas. Um, so the majority of people who experience trauma symptoms immediately after a trauma, which is usually the first one to two months, they will have that dip in functioning. They will return to their homeostatic baseline. We don't wanna label that a disorder. We wanna see that as a temporary drop and then um, eventual they, they will uh, respond. And whether it's through treatment or whether it's through that natural recovery, um, a lot of individuals, the vast majority of individuals will go on to get post-traumatic growth which is a conceptual theory that describes how the thoughts change after trauma. So that's that psychological resiliency that gets developed, where they're able to sort of make meaning out of what happened. And you probably hear this in patients or maybe have experienced it yourself, because even as people that work with a highly traumatized population, we can develop some of this post-traumatic growth, where we're sort of believing you know, that it provides an opportunity to develop more coping uh, strategies. It renews the, your belief in the importance of being present and having compassion for other people, um, or just the resilient capacity of humans. All of those things are part of post-traumatic growth. So let's talk about common reactions. There are both short-term and long-term reactions to trauma. 
um, and they, they start by affecting um, our neurological system. So the traumatic events um, will trigger that alarm response, that fight, flight, freeze response, or that hyperarousal response, um, just like stressors do, but at an even more intense level. And that floods our body with a whole host of neurochemicals, which create a cascade of physiological and psychological symptoms associated with it. Again, in the short term, that's not a bad thing. We will recover once the trauma or the stressor is over and return to baseline. But when it's chronically activated, that HPA axis, that, that, that part of the brain that controls the fight, flight, freeze system, it gets chronically activated, then we end up with a whole host of neuroendocrine problems and structural changes in the brain. So when we're looking at people that have sort of that chronic pattern, their brain actually looks different. Um, we can diagnose a number of disorders associated with trauma exposure, PTSD being one of them. That's probably the most common one that we think of because it's got trauma in the name. Acute stress disorder is another trauma disorder. Um, but then mood disorders, obsessive compulsive uh, disorders and personality, sleep disorders and substance use disorders um, or any kind of addictive behavior all fall under that same category and can be linked to trauma exposure. Another one that's clinically relevant that we uh, is not in the DSM-5, uh, but I believe will be at some point in time, is what's called complex trauma, or other people have called it complex PTSD, depending on the literature. It's endorsed by the National Center for PTSD. Um, what it, what it entails is that you have to have complex childhood trauma, so that stuff that happened in childhood at the hands of a caregiver, then results in not just a profile that looks like PTSD, it also looks a little bit like borderline personality disorder, but it's not borderline personality disorder, it's complex trauma. So we see dysfunction in interpersonal uh, relationships, identity disturbance, mood regulation, adoption of risky behaviors, all kinds of issues around trust and attentional issues. So they kind of look like a combination of borderline personality, PTSD, and ADHD. And I don't know about you guys, but a lot of the patients I treat uh, at UNMH fit that profile very clearly. Um, I want to show you some prevalence rates because I think we, we tend to, when we're thinking about trauma exposure, asking about trauma history, we're mostly focused on PTSD. But you can see the rates are much lower than other conditions. In fact, the number one disorder associated with trauma exposure are anxiety disorders. So when we're working with somebody who doesn't meet criteria for PTSD, but they have a trauma history, we're looking at like an anxiety profile, it is still connected to that trauma. So that, that's important to understand because that will influence the interventions that we provide. Right, so anxiety is much more common, substance use is much more common, and even depressive disorders are more common than PTSD. So PTSD is our least likely outcome, even though it definitely is, is present in a majority of, of the folks that we see. Um, so I think about trauma disorders as falling in this Venn diagram, right? They have a lot of symptom overlap. And so we want to be thinking when we're assessing patients about, you know, kind of where their symptoms are falling and into, into which one of these circles are they falling? Because they could have all of these or just, just the majority are, are clustered in one. And again, that's going to influence the treatment that we provide. Now, I want to just briefly introduce folks that aren't familiar with some of the evidence-based um, psychological treatments, so the psychosocial interventions that we, we could provide. Um, so um, we know that there isn't a specific medication for PTSD, um, and we have some helpful medications for depressive disorders and, and anxiety disorders and substance use disorders. Um, but it's not necessarily going to capture everything. So with folks with trauma exposure that their symptoms you think are, are definitely being driven by that trauma, we want to get them into some kind of psychological therapy um, because that's where they're going to get a lot of um, help shifting those perceptions or those thoughts that are keeping them stuck. Um, so the evidence-based treatments that have been shown to be very effective for treating a range of, um, of the, all the trauma conditions that we started about all fall under the umbrella of CBT. Um, so they include exposure models, um, and some anxiety management procedures, and then uh, cognitive models. Um, now, a word about anxiety management. A lot of people are familiar with seeking safety or um, mindfulness, uh, controlled breathing, uh, different distraction techniques like grounding, thought stopping. Those things are very helpful and can be extremely effective for helping prepare people 
for more intense treatments, but they shouldn't be considered as a standalone treatment. They typically will not effectively treat those conditions by themselves. So you think of them as a, they're part of the milieu, right? They're, they're something that you would wanna offer maybe as a preliminary uh, to starting a more intensive e EBT, or there's something that you're using while you're doing an EBT to help people stay regulated and stay engaged in treatment. We know that one of the most effective treatments, particularly for PTSD, but also for a range of anxiety conditions is exposure therapy. Exposure therapy is a set of techniques that was designed to help people approach instead of avoid. And that means that they're approaching either the feared object situations or even memories of the trauma um, and sort of like flooding the system in a safe way and a strategic way um, to help them to build resilience and to it so they stop avoiding as much. The next um, uh, therapy that's been proven to be extremely effective are cognitive therapies. And that's where we're, they're directly identifying and challenging the dysfunctional thoughts that are associated with keeping them stuck with those symptoms. So replacing those dysfunctional thoughts with more functional or realistic beliefs about themselves, others in the world is very helpful um, for, for quieting that nervous system and helping them to stop avoiding so much. So the evidence-based treatments that are recommended by multiple panels uh, for PTSD include cognitive processing therapy, which comes in group and individual, prolonged exposure, which right now um, is, is primarily individual only, but the Institute uh, is norming a group model, uh, an in vivo exposure group. Um, uh, EMDR, which uh, typically is used individual only, and then acceptance and commitment therapy or ACT, um, which could be done group or individual. Uh, major depressive disorder, we've got interpersonal psychotherapy, uh, interpersonal psychotherapy or IPTD, cognitive behavioral therapy, short-term psychodynamic psychotherapy, and ACT for depression, and then anxiety disorders, IPTA, uh, CBT, ACT for anxiety. So those are all, um, of course, there are many more that are, are very effective treatments, but those are the ones that are sort of the front of the line, have the best data. If you can get your patient those treatments, that's ideal. Um, and another, another thing that, that I like to share in this lecture, because we're talking about patients with substance use disorder, um, is to keep in mind that, that uh, prolong, both prolonged exposure and cognitive processing therapy, which are the two gold standard interventions for PTSD treatment, are considered exemplary treatments by SAMHSA. Um, they are, were selected as model programs for national dissemination because their data is so good and they can be used with patients who are actively using. Um, they're not, they've not been shown to exacerbate uh, use behavior or to trigger relapse. Um, even though they're, they're intense treatments, and they can be quite difficult for patients to get through with enough support, um, patients can be successful um, in doing either of those treatments while using um, or uh, once they've reached a certain level of, of, sub, of sobriety or at least a sobriety window throughout their day and be very effective. And their use behavior decreases along with their PTSD symptoms. So, so um, those are two really amazing treatments um, to, work, to use with our populations. And then my last slide, I just want to introduce some key principles about trauma-informed care. Um, this is something that I could do, I, I've done a whole four-hour lecture on, so this is very, very, very truncated to show you guys one slide. Um, but, but I think just in general, the take-homes here to think about what are the principles to providing good trauma-informed care. Um, making sure that we are providing a safe physical space and a safe psychological space for patients, making sure that all of the work that we're doing is in the service of developing trust and transparency. Um, and I think particularly this one, making sure that we collaborate with them to give them empowerment, voice, and choice. So making sure that they feel that they are making a choice in their care. Um, making sure that we have some way of connecting them to peer support um, and that we are being mindful of or at least open to considering and discussing cultural, historical, and gender issues. So this stuff is not rocket science. Um, it's stuff that any of us uh, can do um, and, and uh, be thinking about, but if you are really attending to these domains, then in principle, you are, you are providing some trauma-informed care. These are the things that, that stand out as what is necessary to help people engage. Because we know that folks that have um, a lot of trauma exposure, they have a lot of issues with trust. And so getting them to really engage with healthcare providers, trust a healthcare provider, 
um, and, and work uh, in a way that keeps them in treatment long enough to get better um, can be quite challenging. So just keeping some of these things in mind can be helpful. So that's all I have for you guys today.